life loss, and uncertainty. The learning objectives for this course are to define key types of uncertainty, identify areas of uncertainty, identify key uncertainties that influence life loss results, discuss the Monte Carlo analysis, Describe tools available to identify and understand uncertainties in the model, and also to discuss why uncertainty matters. Uncertainty is doubt, lack of sureness, the difference between knowledge and ignorance, thing we never knew, things we once knew but forgot, things we don't know we don't know, things we know we don't know. Uncertainty defines the range of possible values within which the true value of the measurement lies. We want to fully understand the who, what, when, where, and why. Who will be impacted? What will happen? Where will it happen? What is the sequence of events that lead it to happen? And what is the probability of it happening in any given year? We are unsure of how some events will play out, such as how many people will take protective action, how many people will attempt to drive through flooded roads if a structure will collapse with the given loading conditions, etc. And since we are unsure of what exactly will happen, we want to have an idea of the range of possibilities. And further, we want to understand the outcomes if one possibility occurs as opposed to another. If we can determine that a certain parameter is impacting our consequences, then we have a better chance of taking action to reduce the uncertainty. Then we have a better estimate of what the results would look like and can better prioritize our resources and funding for high-risk projects. It's important we don't drastically over- or underestimate consequences because they can impact our decision-making. Understand which parameters are driving uncertainty in our particular study area. Understand the range of possible outcomes and how likely they potentially are. Help tell the story of why our model does or does not make sense. Help us understand if more uncertainty means more risk to people or risk of making a poor decision. Knowledge uncertainty. Having uncertainty about when someone will notice a hazard can reduce by increasing surveillance, natural variability, how much it's going to rain, can't do anything about changing the weather. There is a helpful list provided in the LifeSim Technical Reference Manual that lists uncertainties by knowledge or natural uncertainty. There's the uncertainties we have regarding the assumptions we make and inputs we plug into the model. This is not an exhaustive list. And there's also the uncertainties we account for within the model. These are uncertainties not built into LifeSim 2.0. One helpful exercise in understanding uncertainty is understanding what kind of uncertainty you have. Helpful to qualitatively think through this. This is just an example, not exhaustive. This is an example of uncertainties in LifeSim 2.0. This is an example of uncertainties modeled in LifeSim 2.0. Anything that can affect these key elements can impact life loss slash damage results. Depends on the situation, for example. If you have an overtopping situation where you expect there to be plenty of warning, PAI may be the more determining factor on life loss. Or if you have a situation where you're in a very rural area, maybe the warning diffusion becomes more impactful because it takes more time to make sure everyone in the PAR gets warned. Or maybe you have a scenario where there isn't detection until late in the game. So warning issuance becomes most impactful because if the warning doesn't get out quickly, then it's already too late. In that same scenario where the warning isn't expected to be issued until the breach is already progressing due to no detection, now maybe you expect most people will only have time to vertically evacuate in place. The biggest impact on life loss now may come from the uncertainty surrounding the stability of the structures in the hazard zones. To better understand our uncertainties, we perform Monte Carlo analysis. Monte Carlo simulation performs risk analysis by building models of possible results by substituting a range of values, a probability distribution for any factor that has inherent uncertainty.
It then calculates results over and over, each time using a different set of random values from the probability functions. Depending upon the number of uncertainties and the ranges specified for them, a Monte Carlo simulation could involve thousands or tens of thousands of recalculations before it is complete. Monte Carlo simulation produces distributions of possible outcome values. Each iteration in a simulation represents a scenario that could occur given the data uncertainties in the model. The results of the analysis provide a distribution of estimated consequences from a given hazard. Law of large numbers. Over a large number of trials, the sample mean, our estimate, will converge toward the population mean, the true value. Parameter estimates can be very uncertain for small sample sizes. Thousands to millions of Monte Carlo simulations are needed. Some uncertain parameters, such as willingness to enter a flooded road, are defined as distributions. During the Monte Carlo iteration, the distribution is sampled with a random number between 0 and 1 using a random number generator. The random number represents a probability, and the distribution returns the appropriate value for the given probability. So, in this graph, for willingness to enter a flooded road, whatever frequency the random number generator has sampled will be related to the depth at which an evacuating group would be willing to enter a flooded road depending on if a group is evacuating in a low or high clearance vehicle. So each evacuating group is actually being assigned a point along the distribution based on their vehicle type. In addition to distribution sampling, LifeSim also implements curve sampling. Curve sampling is the process of sampling a curve function from an array of distributions. Curve sampling is used for depth damage functions, building stability criteria, PAI functions, and warning diffusion as some examples. Look at results using built-in LifeSim tools. 1. Check parameter correlations in uncertainty plots. 2. Conduct a sensitivity analysis, a method that measures how the impact of uncertainties of one or more input variables can lead to uncertainties on the output variables. To do this, change an input variable and rerun to see if output changes can do this with multiple parameters until find major contributors to output changes. 3. Run a no-warning-slash-no-evac scenario to see what worst-case scenario could look like. As you add in warning and other parameters, does this base scenario improve? 4. Use critical thinking to consider what assumptions you've potentially made and if there is potential to reduce those uncertainties. At least qualitatively sort of rank those uncertainties in your mind and start working down the list. Correlation is the statistical relationship between two variables. Correlation does not equal causation. When we look at uncertainty plots, we are looking for any strong positive or negative correlations or trends in the data. If we look at this uncertainty plot, there appears to be no correlation between life loss and the hazard ID time, so we know that as long as the hazard is identified any time between three hours before breach and a half hour after breach, then life loss will not be significantly impacted for this simulation. So the question we ask ourselves here is if we think the uncertainty range of three hours before to half hour after is reasonable. Or is there a possibility we could identify the hazard even sooner? What happens if we identify the hazard even later? So, let's say as an example, you're in an SQRA and everyone is discussing if they think having cameras at the project would help reduce life loss because it would help you notice the imminent hazard sooner. Do you think that's going to change your life loss enough to change your risk decisions? Not if you still are identifying the hazard within these uncertainty bounds because life loss does not seem strongly correlated with hazard ID, even though there is quite a bit of uncertainty around the hazard ID time. Should you maybe look at how it impacts life loss if you can identify the hazard, say, six hours before? What about mobilization? Here's it's a little more clear that there's a moderate, negative correlation between life loss and PAI. So, the more people who take protective action, the less life loss is experienced. So some questions we might start thinking about include, what measures could we implement to promote higher rates of mobilization? Is our messaging good? 
Now, what if you're at an STRA and everyone is debating if it's worthwhile to provide education to help a community be more prepared to evacuate if needed, thus making them more likely to mobilize quickly? Does that seem like it could potentially reduce consequences in a meaningful way? Means potentially. If you get a higher percentage of the population to mobilize quickly, you can reduce life loss. The values on the x-axis are the actual sampled values used to define the protective action initiation relationship for a given iteration. Lower values will sample curves closer to the lower bound, worst case, and higher values samples a curve closer to the upper bound, best case. Think back to curve sampling slide. So, if this is a strongly correlated parameter, you need to verify the assumptions you made in your PAI preparedness slash perception functions. Maybe I've modeled PAI to be moderately fast. What if I model PAI to be relatively slow instead? Do I have enough data to confirm my original assumption, or is there reason to believe it could be something else? How confident am I? Maybe you have a situation like this where warning issuance doesn't seem to be the big driver of life loss if it's issued 120 to 40 minutes before the hazard. But if it's issued less than 40 minutes before, then the variability in life loss begins to shrink and life loss starts going up. Then once you hit the breach time, it doesn't seem to change life loss much if the warning goes out one minute after or 40 minutes after the event. Therefore, we can tell that warning issuance needs to go out at least 20 minutes prior to breach to have a chance of keeping life loss under 300 people. Notice inflection points. What if you don't include any uncertainty at all or very little uncertainty? In this example, no uncertainty about the warning issuance time for any of the planning zones. This makes it very difficult to see the range of possibilities and determine if the issuance time is significantly impacting life loss. It's important to understand your uncertainty bounds. Is there a lot of uncertainty in the results? Not so much. Other than uncertainty plots, box and whisker plots are also helpful to think about uncertainty. We've been talking about uncertainty within the same bounds, but you also need to think about uncertainty if you change the bounds completely. Need to determine what uncertainty bounds are most reasonable for your given situation and adjust accordingly or have multiple alternatives to compare. For this scenario, we are looking at different uncertainty bounds for the hazard identified relative time, minimal, negative 2 to 0, and ample, negative 6 to negative 2. You can see that within each alternative, the hazard eyed time didn't strongly correlate with overall life loss. But when you compare the scatter plots of the same scenario with different hazard eyed ranges, it becomes more evident that hazard end can impact overall life loss. In the minimal warning scenario, the median life loss stayed pretty consistently above the 60 line, and with the ample uncertainty bounds, median life loss stayed pretty consistently below the 40 line. This is reflected in the final results of the box plots. Which warning scenario is most appropriate for your situation? For example, do you have an overtopping scenario where you have more time to warn people and maybe do some kind of intervention, or do you have an internal erosion scenario where detection is unlikely, intervention is unlikely, and warning time will be limited? This could also apply to other parameters, such as hazard communication, Sensitivity analysis is basically finding out what happens to a dependent variable if various parameters change. For example, what happens to life loss if different parameters change? We can determine this by building multiple alternatives and comparing. Run simulations using different structure inventories, stability criteria, uncertainty bounds. Sometimes small changes may make noticeable differences in results and other times they may not, but it's worth checking. Would allowing contra flow on certain roads change life loss on roads? Does adjusting foundation heights impact results? Does changing uncertainty bounds change results? For instance, does your interpretation of elicitation results vary among team members? If so, try warning and PAI data with curves matching both interpretations. 
We know there is a lot of uncertainty in our models, but understanding those uncertainties gives us the knowledge to answer some complex questions, and there are lots of tools and outputs available to help you answer those questions. Let's talk about some of the unique tools available within the model, the wide range of results you can get out of the model, and ways to think about seemingly straightforward data. On this plot, we have a box to represent each individual iteration ran in our Monte Carlo simulation. Unlike uncertainty plots, this is not comparing any other parameters to life loss. Rather, it's a great tool to compare alternatives. Also, a great way to catch outliers. If you see an outlier, it's a good idea to generate detailed output to see if there's anything interesting about the data. If we do see any interesting iterations on our iteration plot, we can then generate more detailed output for an individual iteration. Doing so allows us to see additional plots and graphs that provide more information on evacuation simulation. How long did it take most groups to evacuate? Is there a large gap between how many people mobilize and how many reach safety? Are there certain destinations that are getting more traffic than others? Should we consider eliminating destinations in certain areas and recommending others? Other than in plot form, we also have tabular data available within the model. Table data three ways. Summary average results by iteration by detailed output. Summary average. What summary zones have the largest PR? Which summary zones experience the highest deaths? Under what loading scenario? What's the population split between O65 and U65? What summary zones have the highest economic damages? Is most life loss on roads or in structures? Iteration. How does the data vary from the iteration with the lowest life loss from the iteration with the highest life loss? Did I run enough iterations, or do I think running more iterations would provide more information? Do I want to look at any of these iterations in more detail to see what's going on? Detailed output. Why did a certain group not mobilize? Was it because the evacuating depth had already been reached, or was their fording depth surpassed, or was there a car caught on the road segment they were getting on? Did a certain structure get warned at all? Why was a certain caught group put in the high or low hazard zone? Was it because their vehicle stability was surpassed, or because their human stability was surpassed? Road data in LifeSim Summary Which structures are getting the most life loss? Does the amount of life loss make sense given the structure occupancy type, depths, PAR, etc.? Were those structures with high life loss getting warned? Do the summary statistics reveal any helpful information about certain structures? Detail output. What structures, if any, collapsed? Did the foundation height, stability criteria, etc. make sense for the structures that collapsed? Were the structures with the highest life loss warned in an area that made sense? Did they have high life loss because they collapsed, or because the PAR had limited mobility, or because they had fine mobility? but the submergence thresholds were surpassed. This gives you a chance to look at arrival data, max depths, and velocities across all the structures or roads in your inventory. Helpful in figuring out how much time people have to evacuate, structures at risk of losing stability, roads that are very unsafe to travel on. This gives you a chance to look at arrival data, max depths, and velocities across all the structures or roads in your inventory. Helpful in figuring out how much time people have to evacuate, structures at risk of losing stability, roads that are very unsafe to travel on slash. Because it impacts decision making. Again, we are trying to make risk informed decisions. You need to be able to determine if uncertainty in results impacts anything and if you can mitigate any risk. If you have a scenario where all of your iterations are falling squarely in the 10 to 100 life loss range, you can feel confident in how changing the frequency of the event will impact the overall level of risk. What decision are you trying to make? How does the level of risk impact your decision? Have I picked reasonable uncertainty bounds in calculating this estimate? From uncertainty plots to tabular data, 
to box and whisker plots, hydraulic data, and data that can be visualized in our map window, there is a trove of data available to you in LifeSim. I just wanted to introduce you briefly to some of the data you can utilize because this is how you are ultimately going to piece together the logic of your model and determine if and where changes need to be made and what is driving life loss. Building a model is an iterative process. Even with all this data available to us, we are often guilty of overlooking common mistakes or failing to adequately interpret the results and communicate what is happening within the model. Jesse is going to give a presentation on Friday that talks more about how to use your knowledge about uncertainty, the tools available in LifeSim, and all the data to help tell the story and interpret what is going on. Ultimately, we want everyone to leave with an idea of how to determine. What adjustments need to be made to the model? Who, what, when, where, why? Does it make sense? Take a moment to answer the question. Take a moment to answer the question.